Okay, this is Lenny Milner um, talking about the vocabulary in Hansen and Quinn Unit 9, which is on page 245. Um, there are a bunch of contract verbs. Uh, why don't we look at them first? Uh, they're all verbs that are derived apparently from a noun or an adjective, except for one of them. Uh, the first is adikeo from the adjective adikos, which means unjust. So adikeo means to do something unjust, to, to wrong someone. It can take a direct object or to do something wrong. Notice it's an epsilon contract verb. The principal parts are very predictable. Adikeso, edikeso, edikeka, edikemai, edikethein. The epsilon becomes an eta outside of the present system. Um, and if you looked at we look at poieo, another epsilon contract. The principal parts are the same, poieso, poieso, and so forth. There's no uh, clear verb that uh, a noun that this verb comes from, but it means to make or do. Um, the book points out that you can use it as a, to express a fundamental idea, like the word do in English. So you can say uh, do art or do do uh, football and mean play it or uh, paint. Um, so so the verb poieto expresses the essential idea of an action. <clears throat> so you can say in Greek do sacrifice and it means with a noun that means sacrifice and it means to sacrifice. Um, anyhow uh, the other meaning of poieto is compose. The book gets that wrong. It doesn't mean uh, to, to create. It means to uh, actively compose something and perform it at the same time um, in at least its original meaning. And that, that's where it comes to be related, uh, to be a word for poetry. Uh, poietes, a person who poie, who composes as a poet. <clears throat> um, uh, you can see this, it was graphic, vividly demonstrated by Professor Gregory Nage, that if you look at the biographies of Homer, the so-called lives of Homer, the older ones have ho described Homer as poyer his epic, as doing it, okay, um, and the newer ones have him as writing, grafo, and what poyer means is composing it. Um, all right, so there's there are those two epsilon contract verbs. There are also two alpha contract verbs, nikao, and timao, nikao comes from a noun nike, which gives us the name of the sneaker company, uh, which means victory. So nikao means to to win, to, to gain a victory, but also to defeat somebody. Um, and it takes a direct object in that sense. Again, the principal parts are follow the same rule. The final vowel of the stem before the personal ending, nika, becomes an eta. So we got nikeso outside of the present system, nikeso and nikeso and so forth. And the same with timao, timeso, a timeso, and tetimeka, and so forth. Um, uh, timao comes from a noun time, that means prestige or honor. And so it's a verb that means to honor someone. Uh, um, let's look at some of the nouns in this lesson. The first one is agon, agonos. Um, Notice that it becomes a circumflex in the genitive that follows the rule about persistent accent of nouns. Um, the book tells you it means contest or struggle, and this word is cognate, or is the word from which the English word agony comes. But there's another very important meaning of this word that the book has neglected, which is an assembly or a gathering, and the relationship between the two is uh, something worth considering. That is, an agon is an ordeal that happens in the context of an assembly of people, of a, f of a festival usually. So it's a ritual term in origin. Um, the, uh, the next noun is daimon daimonos, which the book tells you means god, goddess, or divine being. Notice that like the word theos, it can be of either gender. It can be ha daimon, which would mean the god, or he daimon, the goddess. <clears throat> um, what's the difference then between these two words? Theos means a god, and daimon means a god or a divine being. Uh, the 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 uh, standard uh, explanation is that at least in the fifth century uh, BC, you use daimon when you don't know which god it is, and use theos when you when you do. 
okay? So or when it's clear from the context which God it is, uh, there's an element, in other words, of uncertain, uncertainty in a polytheistic system of identifying the God that may be affecting you or your world or your um, your environment at the moment, at any given moment. So this you know, usage is something practical that that's important within the system. Um, next noun is anama or namatos, which we have in as a compound uh, in things like pseudonym and antonym and homonym. Uh, it's a word for name. Notice it's a neuter noun of the third declension. Um, when we have the noun pera, with a long alpha, a short alpha rather, in the nominative, but a long alpha in the genitive and the dative. That alpha is would be an eta except because of, uh, of the, in the genitive and the dative, except because there's a row there, it becomes it pre preserves the original long alpha. So pera is a short alpha. You can tell from the accent. The accusative is going to be peron, also with a circumflex. And then there are two uh, words derived from pera, a word that means trial or attempt at something, as not trial in the, in the uh, legal sense, okay, um, but but a trial of a of a of a. Uh, in the sense of a test, okay, um, and also more generalizing, in, it just means an experience of a certain kind. So m peros, which is a compound of this noun with the uh, preposition m, or n, rather n, and beco n becomes a mu before a p, means experienced and acquainted with. Notice it's a two-termination adjective, m peros, m peron. There's no separate feminine or masculine uh, gender, there's one form, emperos, that's both masculine and feminine, and emperon is neuter. And you also have correspondingly the abstract noun, so-called abstract noun, emperia. Note that before I go there, emperos governs the genitive, so you understand when you want to say somebody's experienced in or with something, you put the thing that they're experienced in or with in the genitive case, that's not what we would expect. Um, Emperia, where we get empiri empiricism and stuff like that, uh, comes from this the noun we noun emperia, which means uh, experience. Um, there are two more nouns: sige, feminine noun uh, of the first declension, sige, sige, hey, that means silence. Um, and then, oh, well, there are two more: tropos, tropu. Um, the book tells you it means way or manner. Um, or character. The, this is a noun from the verb trepo that means to turn. So uh, it means way or manner and character because what you're talking about is the standard way in which something uh, proceeds through space, okay? So the, 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 that, that gives you way or manner and then character is something like we have the same metaphor when you talk about a person's bent, which means their particular talent. Um, so it's the it's the little thing that distinguishes you, the twist on your, in your and your particular configuration that makes you into something that you that's typical of you. Um, the last down is a very one of a very unusual and very old type, hydor. And notice the nominative has a long omega. And uh, ends in a row, okay, and then the genitive is hudatos. You've lost the omicron or omega, and there's no row to be seen in the genitive and the other forms. Okay, it's a neuter noun, so the nominative and the accusative are the same. Are the same, and this is the word for water in ancient Greek. We we have hydraulic and stuff like that uh, derived from it, um, and. Uh, but this is there's there are very it's a very old class of nouns. A very um, there's a one example of a noun like this whose nominative ends in r but has a uh, um, uh, what's what's behind that alpha there is actually an n. So this is an inflection in which the r and the the rho and the nu originally varied. So hudor it was hudor hudn das and that n became an a. Uh, you have the same thing in the word for the thigh bone in Latin, which is femur, uh, femur, and then the genitive is feminis. There you have the R, and you can actually see the end in the Latin form. Um, 
again, these are, it's a very old Indo-European type of inflection, and there aren't many nouns in Greek that preserve it. So um, let's now look at the adjectives that the list has. There's alagos, alagon. Notice a two-termination adjective because, uh, like emperos, it's a compound adjective, um, and it means without reasoning, okay, without logic, uh, irrational. Um, again, the alagos form is both masculine and feminine, and alagon is the neuter. The next word is barbaros, barbaron, okay, which notice again, there's no separate feminine distinct from the masculine. There is one form for both, but this is not, uh, at least not currently, um, a uh, compound na adjective. Um, what it is is a very old adjective, and it goes back to a time before there was a feminine form distinct from a masculine form originally in the the gender system in Greek consisted of animate or an Indo-European consist of nouns and adjectives that were animate that is alive um, and inanimate that were not um, so uh, these there are, there are a few old words like barbaros old adjectives but ne not were not compound but never had a separate feminine and barbaros preserved it. it tells you that it means non-Greek or foreign. Don't be tempted to translate it barbarian. That has, um, uh, 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 it, 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 to Greeks it, it means people who are not Greek, and then, then that sort of disintegrated into being a negative word, um, but it doesn't always have that significance in Greek. It just means somebody who's not one of, one of the ethnocentric group of Greeks. They still think they're better than others, others for sure. But, oh, okay. I missed another noun I see. That's the noun bios biu, from which we get biography and biology, the word for the word for man, or the life rather, or means of life. It means the way in which you survive, as well as life itself. Um, to go back to the adjectives, we got ekthros, ekthra, ekthron. Notice you've got a long alpha in the, gen in the feminine form because there's a row there. The long alpha is preserved. And it tells you this means hated or hostile, or when it's substantivized, in other words, when you put an article in front of it, if you say ha ekthros or he ekthra, it means the hostile person, the enemy. It's different from polemios, a word that means hostile, and in the plural means the enemy as a collective, right? Hoi polemioi means the enemy, but it means the enemy that, that is a collective, that is a group. Whereas ekthros is an individual em enemy. So ekthros is the opposite of philos, okay? A f person whose philos is near and dear to you and part of your, uh, in a sense, part of your family. Um, so, it, it, and, and there isn't a distinction between uh, blood relatives and friends in Greek, okay? Philoi includes your relatives as well as the people whom you love. So ekthros. It, you can even say that you can't have an ekthros in Greek unless it, the ekthros once was a philos. So an enemy is a person who should be near and dear to you, but who isn't. Like that concept? Anyhow, um, next adjective we have is one of the two demonstratives that we have in Greek, hada heda tada, which is a compound of the definite article and the enclitic particle de. So it has an accent on the first syllable, um, and it's just inflected like the ha part is inflected like the definite article. And the book translates that this, and then there's hutas haute tuta, is inflection you learn in this lesson. And it translates that one, this and that. Remember, this is because the book doesn't understand a two demonstrative system. The hada heda tada means instead this the, the, of mine, okay, and hutas means this of yours, um, whereas akenos is a third person demonstrative, that thing of hers or his or theirs, okay? So um, you have this in, in some romance languages, a, two demo, a three demonstrative system. Um, let's not confuse it by saying one means this and that and the other only this. The it, there is this beautiful thing of an adjective derived from the demonstrative hutos, word for um, this of yours, and that's hutos. It puts the s in parentheses, 
the, the, oh, the os ending is the usual ending for an adverb, but in the case of hutos, it's weirdly uh, different. You only put the s at the end of huto when the next word begins with a vowel. When it begins with a consonant, in other words, this is huto without the s. Um, and it means thus, okay, which is actually the adverb uh, originally from this, in this way, or thus. Okay. Um, I think that's everything except for the very last word, the preposition hyper, which governs two cases, genitive and the accusative. The accusative, I think, is easier to understand. It means beyond, in the sense of going beyond, okay, or over what's, what you should. So if you go beyond the limit, you put the limit in the accusative case after hyper, whereas the hyper with the genitive means over or above in place, not moving, okay, and from the idea of being over something and protecting it, supposedly you get this notion of on behalf of uh, someone, someone or something, uh, um, having a benevolent relationship uh, to the positional relationship of being above someone. All right, that's the nouns in this lesson, and adjectives and verbs and preposition.